this, the title of my presentation this morning is Age, Sex and the Internet. Now really, could it be the secret to the revitalisation of our rural communities? Well, quite possibly, but probably not the way you're thinking about it at the moment. One of the things that's a real dilemma with our communities is that often they seem like this strange paradox where they often look like busy places in decline. And one of the reasons for that is that when we look at making changes in places, there are three key things we need to consider before we make those actions. We do need to understand the place itself, its identity. We, under, we do need to understand the values from the community and we do need to understand the trends. Now in the past we've been very good at identifying the character and heritage of a place. We're getting better and better with our consultation and community engagement to identify the values, visions, aspirations of our communities. But we haven't been that good with really understanding the trends. What are the forces of change, the internal and external forces of change that are at play that we can't affect but we need to understand before we make decisions about how we're going to transform our communities that we can achieve the aspiration, the common real asp aspiration is protect our lifestyle and provide jobs for our kids. Now if you ever paused a moment and say, what a paradox is that? Protect our lifestyle, don't change anything. Create jobs for our kids, which we don't know how to do, so we've got to make a lot of changes. So we put our aspirations at the point of how do we work to solve that. So as we've sort of worked well with place and values, my presentation today is talking a little bit about some of the insights, the trends, that might give you some brain food to think about it. And one of, of course, one of the biggest trends is the move from the industrial economy to the knowledge and the experiential economy. That's a mega trend across the Western world. And it's something that's going to impact our rural communities significantly, something we need to prepare for to work out how can we help that transition. It's going to be a world that's completely different to the past. It's a trend that's unstoppable. We need to understand it. And one of the things with that trend is that effectively we're at the end of the growth curve of the industrial economy. Now, if we're going to create a place that's there for our kids and grandkids, it's like, what is the catalyst? What is the transformation that we can do that will bring our communities to be able to tap into the growth in the economy, the vitality of the next wave that's going to change? Employment will be different. The world will be different. But if we don't identify those transformational changes, we're going to be trapped at the end of that growth curve and our communities will continue to decline. So it is a point about we need to search for that catalyst. It is one of our transformation. It's one of those mega trends that is absolutely unstoppable. And one of the other big trends that we often hear a lot about is ageing. But it's interesting when you look and work within rural and regional communities, how these trends affect us differently. That from a national point of view, in the Asians, ageing is going to be an issue for the nation in 2050. They're talking that 23% of our population will be over 65. But you know, in our regions, we're going to be there 20 years before that. Our regions are ageing twice as fast as the national average. Now, you know what that means? If we don't get our act together, don't think that any policy is going to come out of the cities to deal with ageing until 20 years after we've actually lived through it. So it really is up to us to see these amazing impacts that are very different in our rural and regional communities and much faster than what's happening with cities, where a lot of the policy and thinking comes from. The upside of that is the initiatives and investment in our rural communities to look at ways that we can adapt and change socially and economically as we deal with this ageing is a window to the future for all of Australia. So really, the learnings that we can get from helping to invest our, in our rural communities will be learnings that can be taken back to our cities as they deal with these unstoppable trends in the future. And with ageing again in rural communities, it's dramatic. It's amazing when you're out there. These are figures of Hinchinbrook community in far north Queensland. It is one of the local government areas that is ageing faster than most, so it's a real window to our own communities. In four years' time, for the first time ever in that community, there's going to be more people over 65 than under 25. Four years away. 
What does that do to our perceptions of what is rural identity and lifestyle and the memories we might have? Because the future in our towns are going to be so different. It's an experience that is going to change socially and economically the shape of it. And the thing is, when you look at most rural communities, they're all on this trajectory. Within the next 10 years, a lot of our rural communities are going to be crossing that line that we've never been there before. And this is part of this transformation and change. The future is going to be so different. We need to think about what will be our smartest actions to give our kids and grandkids a future in rural and regional Australia. And it even gets more interesting, because ageing is one thing that's common, but you know what? You can link ageing with spending. So ever since we started the consumption economy, there's a whole lot of figures in the last 30 or 40 years how it identifies our consumption spending changes as we age. To the point that when you're 65 and over, you're actually spending 50% less on consumption than when you were 46. That actually means a community full of aged people is only spending 50% of what they were 20 years ago in the same place. This is how places can look busy and still be declining. And why 46 is the highest peak in consumption spending? Because that aligns with our family formation period. That is when parents have their kids in high school. If you've ever had your kids in high school, you know your wallet is always empty. It is that dynamic, the family element is not only the social glue of our rural community, it's the economic glue. And you begin to see the loss of that demographic, the impact socially and economically, but also what we need to do to balance our ageing demographic and regions. We need to think about families. They're the focus point. And then you say, well, how much does it cost to raise a family? And isn't it interesting? The poverty line for two parents and two children is $52,000. So if we're not creating jobs in our rural communities that are salaries for more like fifty dollars to $100,000, we are doing nothing to attract families of the future into our communities. We've got to look at ways that we can create employment that our families can come here and can afford to have kids and take them to high school. That really begins to focus a challenge of what sort of employment we're really looking at that's going to make the difference for sustainability of our communities. And part of that family dynamic, the world is changing. These families of the future are going to be different. And the enterprise mums are going to be here. And by that, do you realise, and this is one of the big trends that's right across the Western world now, that right now, there's more women than men finishing high school. There's more women than men graduating from university. So that really means our families of the future is more likely that household, the mother, is probably going to be more educated than the father. The mother's probably earning more money than the father. And then those families that want to choose to come and enjoy our lifestyle in the regions to raise a family, it's quite likely these highly skilled and connected women want to be still productive and engaged in the economy. What are we doing to support these new families, this new thing? This completely turns on its head our traditional view of family and what we do in country towns and what we should do to support families. And these are trends that are happening out there. This will be the shape of the future. And one of those key points when you look at the average age of a mother and the first child is almost 30 years old. So what we're sort of saying that are we looking at the families of the future well, those parents of those children are going to be children of the 1980s. So what we're really saying, if you wanted to ask one question to test how much future your place has got, you'd say, well, is your town a good place to start a business, to capture the, the economy and the income of the future, and raise a family for Gen Y parents? Starts to focus it a bit, doesn't it? Because as soon as you say that, you're drawn to the next mega trend, which is really the internet and the digital revolution. Part of what we need to do in our transformation is to really understand how these new families are going to connect and operate in a world that's digitally connected. And the emergence of the third screen, we've gone from TV to PC to mobile device. It's here now, it's everywhere, it's ubiquitous. We need to really understand what that means with those new families want in our regions and rural areas. As we move from that sort of transactions to relationship building, that whole notion of social networking, the web 2.0 world, well, you know the amazing thing in that is it actually empowers the individual. 
It empowers the individual as a consumer. It empowers the individual as a citizen. It empowers the individual who has got an interest within the community. And you know, the amazing thing about that for us in rural and regional areas, it actually empowers the place people cherish. And isn't that our core brand? Don't we believe our place, our identity and lifestyle is fantastic and authentic? Web 2.0 actually empowers those places. Those places that treat people with authenticity are supportive. It actually is a place that the Web 2.0 world promotes and people are drawn to. People want to be part of the future in connected, authentic communities. What an opportunity. What an opportunity. So if you're really looking across at the bigger scale to say, how could we have transformational infrastructure? How could we do things that are going to help us jump to the next growth curve? The sort of changes. Well, you could look at it in a way that there's five areas. Firstly, I talk about the highways. When we're talking about the regions, we've just got to really accept distance will always be part of our lifestyle and our infrastructure. And distance and how well we connect ourselves is going to be incredibly important for our future. So in the past, you talked about you know, road and air and rail, but the next challenge we need to do is have the best digital connections, the best digital highways, because distance and travel and connection is our essence in rural and regional areas. So we need, the other part is about hospitals. And you say, oh yeah, well, you know, there's a lot of old people, we need hospitals, and that's not the point. If you really think about this, if we want a future, we need to keep the maternity services. We need to keep the health services for children. So mothers of children are confident to come to your community and raise their family there. We can't afford those family health services to disappear and just focus on the obvious of say, oh, we need aged health services. And when I talk about high schools, in a way, if you want to look at one indicator that'll give you a chance of a future, has your town or locality got a high school? Because, you know, what's the point of generating well-paid jobs is as soon as people, the parents, get to that demographic, they're going to spend the most, be the most, be most socially connected, they have to leave your town because of their kids' high school education. We've got to protect, expand and develop our high schools in the regions. And that goes right down to education. We need to turn on our head this notion of daycare. We've got to really reinvent what is the right support structure for the enterprise mums who want to be out and join our lifestyle, raising children but contributing to our economy. We've got to reinvent our support services even at that level. And the new infrastructure is really about it. We're looking at growth. We are looking at growth in rural and regional areas. The only way we can balance our ageing is to grow more family, to grow work. And the interesting thing when you're, when you're in regional areas, there's usually never an empty house. It is about how we're going to expand and grow things in a way that protects identity and lifestyle. But be careful, think about it. If we're looking at housing, we need to think about who do we want to attract. The one reason people want to move to our areas is to have an alternative experience from cities and urban centres. There's no point building the same sort of dense housing that's in an urban area if we're trying to attract families in that to have a particular lifestyle value, which is our only point of difference, in rural and regional areas. So it's very important that the shape and form of those decisions are incredibly important. And then hubs. You know, at the end of the day, we have towns that have come from the industrial era. We've got to look at the transformational shape that we need to do to help support the innovation and entrepreneurs of the Gen Y families. Do we really think a bit of streetscaping and a litter bin makes a new Gen Y innovation incubator? There, we've got to get our head around what is the missing infrastructure? Do you realise the industrial estates of the future the places that are generate our most wealth are going to be our main streets and the innovation hubs that are connected to them. Because in the future, you can run your business without walls. In a wireless world, and in a Gen Y world where authenticity is placed as important, business will happen in the heart of your community, in the main street. It needs to be supportive. There's a whole lot of technology and form and environment that we never thought about when we designed our industrial towns to service ag the agricultural economy. We've gone from, not only from sheds to studios, now we're also almost in the wireless world. And that comes back to the centre of your community, the hub, the place. How attractive is that for the Gen Y family to be productive and be part of the future? Three fast-track ways to get there is, 
You could, in every community, there's always projects. Go and have a look at those projects. See the ones that actually support your identity and lifestyle that you believe are going in the right direction. And then develop those projects with local leaders, with the community. Get engagement, flesh them out, make them multi layered Find out how these projects can add to education, health, business and lifestyle. And then when we look at structuring those, getting action, finding the quick actions, but also let's be way more innovative on how we fund and, st and structure those, the public, the private sector. Look at the new platforms of crowdfunding and sourcing that we can bring into communities to help to get infrastructure funded. It's about partnerships and innovation. So, in conclusion, I just want to end with a bit of a story because at the end of all that, you could quite rightly feel in the audience, that's a bit much to ask. That's too hard to change. What are you talking about? Change and courage and transformation in rural communities? Oh, I don't, you know. Can we do it? Well, for me, the answer to that question came from a conversation with an old sugarcane farmer. We're on his property. We're looking at some heritage agricultural equipment because we're trying to set up a display in his nearby town. And what struck me was we're on this farm. It was the first farm in the district that got a tractor. And this was, of course, when he was a lot younger. And I thought, isn't that interesting with Stan? I said to him, what? How come your father was such a visionary? How, where did he find the courage to embrace the technology and transform the farm? And he said, well, this is how it happened. He said, when I was young and I finished school, he said, I came on the farm. And amongst many, among my many jobs, he said, I had to look after the horses. I had to feed them, water them, harness them up to, so they go and pull the equipment. At the end of the day, unharness them, put them in the paddock, look after the paddock. He said, you know, it was important work and it was hard work. He said, we'd heard that the dealerships had come to town and they were promoting these tractors and they were actually offering the first year without payments. And he said to me, you know, my father really wasn't interested. He knew horses. He knew that what they could do, he wasn't really too sure about this machinery would be worth the investment. And then the guy paused and he looked at me and he said, you know, I was in there like a flash. I didn't want to keep looking after those bloody horses. He said, I signed the contract, I came home and told my old man, we've got a tractor for the farm. He said, within two years, we paid it off. Completely transformed our farm and production. And I thought to myself, a smile, I thought, isn't that the truth? You know, to kickstart the practical innovation that has always been at the heart of our vibrant rural communities, all we have to do is to rediscover that youthful appetite for change. Thank you. Mm -hmm.